Good morning. Wow, how grateful I am to be with you. Your kindness, your welcome, your hospitality in these few short weeks since my arrival have been light and love to me. Thank you. And thank you for trusting me to walk with you into the exciting unfolding future of First Church. I am just a kid from Akron, Ohio. So while you may think it was some divine nudging combined with Laura's skills for persuasion, I really just came to LA to follow LeBron James. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Almost Famous is one of my very favorite movies. It features a gifted young writer named William Miller who just before his 15th birthday lands a Rolling Stone interview with a fictional band called Stillwater. William takes to the road and over the course of the story finds it impossible to get Russell, the lead guitarist, to take time off from his rock and roll lifestyle to sit down with him. Guitarist, am I right? William finally goes home defeated, his shot at rock journalism fame hanging in the balance. Now there's a statute of limitations on calling spoiler alert, right? I mean, this movie came out 19 years ago, I'm safe. Well, regardless, spoiler alert. To William's surprise, a mutual love interest from the road tricks Russell into showing up at William's home. So the two finally sit down for their interview. William grabs his mic and hits record. So Russell, what do you love about music? Russell thinks for a moment, smiles, and then replies, to begin with, everything. That's my initial reaction to the question that serves as the title of my message today. What's the Bible got to do with justice? To begin with, everything. Admittedly, however, there's an asterisk next to that response. For I think that one of the most dangerous phrases we can utter is, the Bible says, or worse, the Bible clearly says. Once we give voice to one verse, another voice from another of the Bible, 66, stands up and says, objection. Opposing voices are sometimes found in the very same book. For what looks like a tidy library collection, accurately labeled, is rather a messy catalog, an amalgamation of voices, some known and most unknown, that for nearly 1,100 years detail humanity's wrestling with this divine mystery, how we relate to her, and therefore to the world and to one another. This is rarely neat, one-size-fits-all kind of work. Even the theme of justice is rigorously debated throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. Is God's justice primarily retributive or restorative? Depends on who you ask. Is God's justice good news or not so good news? Depends on where you sit. Today we pass the microphone to Isaiah, one of the major prophets in the Hebrew scriptures or the Protestant Old Testament. His is one voice among many in the scriptures that powerfully clarifies God's justice and how that justice takes shape in the lives of God's people. What he and others reveal we might call God's vision or God's dream for the world. That's primarily what prophets do. See, for them, it's not so much about telling the future as it is boldly giving voice to God's future, God's hope for the world, and then courageously naming the ways in which we can become co-creators of that future with God now, in the present. God's vision, as told by Isaiah, is for the worshiping community of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, to be precise. And their worship life, it looks good. I mean, really good. Upon returning from exile in Babylon, the people are experiencing a revival of sorts. They're excited to be home. They're gathering regularly to worship. They're even fasting, abstaining from food and drink, and their physical hunger is reminding them of their hunger for God. They're finding meaning in all the motions, and they're doing the motions well. And yet, something is still missing. 
an authentic experience of the divine in their midst. So they file a formal complaint. God, why do we fast but you do not see? Why humble ourselves but you do not notice? The divine response through Isaiah's voice, look, I see it all. But the more self-conscious you've become about your improved worship life, the less you've remained open to God's vision of justice for the broader community. You fast, great, but at the very same time, workers in your employ remain oppressed. You're busy with rituals while your neighbors are yet crushed under an inequitable system. You raise your hands to God and worship, but clench your fists tight when your neighbors are starving and in need. Your order of worship is impressive, yes, and yet you resist letting worship reorder your lives. You speak of thoughts and prayers, and yet no meaningful action follows. I wonder how we, this morning, will take the lights that we've lit in this time of prayer and take them beyond these walls into our community. Is this not the fast that I choose? To lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. What a profoundly inspiring place. What possibilities so many of us feel just entering these sacred walls, at least that's how I felt a few weeks ago when I first came here. What wonders we've already experienced as worship unfolds each week. Our hunger for God is met in all kinds of ways here in the sanctuary, and thanks be to God. But then we leave mindful of and committed to those whose daily bread is not guaranteed. What we do here is never separate from the possibilities that await outside. Never separate from the transformation that God has already begun out there. And that begs our participation, our hands, our hearts, and our voices. The yoke of which Isaiah speaks and that God would see loosed and finally broken is a symbol for the bonds of oppression of the world. A symbol of all the ways that we all tie others to ourselves in order to bend their actions to our benefit. The ways in which we all use others, knowingly or many times unknowingly, for our gain or for our selfish purposes. To loose this yoke means to offer freedom and release for people who have been used for someone else's gain. And it's not just a loosening, however, so that the next person or people can come along and tighten the cords again. No, the prophet's prognosis for God's people also means addressing the attitudes and structures which make injustice possible in the first place. We want a succinct statement for the prophet's vision of justice in the Hebrew scriptures. This is it, to lose the yoke and to break the bonds. This also happens to be a cornerstone of Jesus' own ministry. He uses a few chapters beyond our reading today from Isaiah in his very first sermon. The late modern-day prophet and poet Maya Angelou wrote, Do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. Throughout this series, Everyday Justice, our pastors have come for our straws, our food, our clothes, and our shopping bags, helping us all know better and then hopefully to do better. To be reminded that the small daily choices we make are never isolated, but have real world effects. That our daily choices, mundane and harmless though they seem, can further entrench inequalities or help loosen the cords. Unbind the yoke just the slightest bit more. Today in my first sermon as your new senior associate minister, I have been charged with maybe the most difficult one yet. I am coming for our coffee and chocolate. <laughs> now, I am not a coffee drinker, but chocolate, I'd rather not know better. It was sobering this week to learn that maybe the most accessible and cheapest item in any grocery store or gas station across this nation 
likely relied on the labor of children. According to a 2015 U.S. Department of Labor report, more than 2 million children are engaged in dangerous labor and agricultural slavery in cocoa-growing regions of West Africa, a region responsible for two-thirds of the world's cocoa supply. Many children are trafficked into the work, while others migrate from surrounding countries because there is no work at home. Poverty is broadly understood to underlie these problems, so until that root cause is alleviated, the problem is expected to persist. But there is hope, because consumers have and continue to raise their voices to express the importance that their chocolate, that their cocoa be made ethically. Companies, since the beginning of this century, when these reports first came out, have slowly begun to ensure their cocoa comes from certified sources that refuse to use child labor. In exchange for meeting ethical standards, farmers are paid as much as 10% more for their cocoa. Organizations like Fair Trade that we have the opportunity to meet today following worship guarantee that their coffee and chocolate are made ethically and that farmers are paid higher prices for their cocoa and, cho and coffee, not merely a fraction of the cost of sustainable production. Just yesterday, I found the fair trade label on more than eight items in the candy aisle at Target. Did you know that candy companies rely on impulse buys for 90% of their sales? 90%. So perhaps this week we let Isaiah tag along into the grocery store with us. Recall his vision to mind, especially in that long checkout line as that candy shelf begs our attention. Is this not the fast I have chosen, says our God? Perhaps it's fasting itself, reducing our consumption some or altogether. Paul Schoenmacher of the Dutch chocolate company Tony's Chocolonely whose company is paying as much as 40% more to farmers to guarantee them and their workers a living wage, said something that quite shocked me this week. He said, nobody needs chocolate. I thought to myself, oh, really? He continued, it's a gift to yourself or someone else. And we think it's absolute madness that for a gift that no one really needs, so many people suffer. I have to be honest, I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to lead that boycott. But I am ready to take one step toward it by buying fair trade after worship and in the weeks and months to come as we'll have it available here at the church. As one activist in the fair trade movement put it, I want to never voluntarily put someone in a situation of poverty, exploitation, and debt just to enjoy a cup of joe. So... Now we know better. How will we do better? How will daily decisions about the clothes we buy and the plastic we use, the coffee that we must have before anyone is allowed to address us in the morning, or the chocolate we must have to unwind and de-stress from work at night, how will these decisions reflect the God of justice that we meet over and over again in these walls in our worship and in the library of scripture. A God that longs to see people set free, having what they need for viable life. Yes, the scope of it all feels overwhelming, thoroughly. And then I hear my mother, what she used to say to my four siblings and I all the time when we were overwhelmed with a project or just with life. Start small, Michael. Start small, take a deep breath, and then off you go. When we come to this place each week, it is our chance to breathe. To breathe in the goodness and love and hope and justice of God. Let God's vision for the world delight and fill our senses. Then we go out to exhale to outwardly live and show forth the vision, God's vision, God's dream of abundant life for all people and for the earth itself. Then your light will shine forth like the dawn, Isaiah concludes. And oh, how we need light and love to shine forth in this world today. Yes, it all feels overwhelming, but 
there's you. Yes, you. But Michael, you've only known us for three weeks. And honestly, that's all the time I've needed. I have hope because there is you. I echo now the words of a living prophet and a pastoral hero of mine, the great Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Let us go to do our little bit of good where we are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Amen.